He wants me, he did ask me to explain to him, show him the evidence that um, plants don't feel pain and, because that's what I said in my post, and I don't think that plants feel pain, but he wants me to explain that. When I think back on 2016, I think the biggest blow up argument I had with my brothers, and maybe I should be thankful for this, was over the Hall of Fame ballot for this year. I don't consume baseball anymore. Um, strictly because of the use of leather within that professional sport. But when I was a kid, watched baseball all the time, played baseball, a lot of baseball. So there are players that are coming up now for Hall of Fame induction that I watched when I was a child that I have an attachment to that I can't ignore. So we do enjoy talking about that. We do enjoy discussing who we think should get in, who shouldn't. And me and one of my baby brothers have a fundamental disagreement on how the decision should be made. He feels as though the numbers should tell the whole story. So you should be able to compare players and their numbers, and the numbers, their stats, should dictate who gets in, who doesn't. I, on the other hand, am not as analytical in a sense, not as scientific. I think that a lot of those players are coming from an era where untraceable steroids were rampant, where testing wasn't was was not what it is now. And everyone has amazing numbers. Everyone has monstrous numbers. And in general, the guys in the Hall of Fame ballot have great numbers. In some ways, I think comparing the numbers overcomplicates it and becomes confusing. To a degree, I throw out the numbers. I throw out the statistics. I throw out who tested positive for steroids and who didn't. And I just think back and I decide based on who I thought was a great player. Who within that air was truly more skilled? Who, with or without steroids, would have rose, risen to the top? Who was the cream? Who truly was the best? And for that reason, our answers, who should get in, who shouldn't, differ greatly. He is a no on Barry Bonds. I am a 100% yes on Barry Bonds. Strictly because, I mean, Barry Bonds has great numbers. But again, to some level, I think even if you throw out the numbers, Barry Bonds is the greatest player I ever saw play. No one was more ferocious in the batter box than Barry Bonds. He was the guy who you would walk with the bases loaded in a key situation because he was that dangerous. He's the only, only batter I ever saw play who, was in, who I felt was in complete control when he was in the batter's box, regardless of, whether or not, regardless of how good the pitcher was. And that was special. Bonds was great in every aspect of the game. The way he walked around on the field, the way he looked on the field, the way he moved was so sure, was so easy. And for that reason alone, I would put Bonds in the Hall of Fame. Strictly because the eye test, how I feel about him. He's the greatest player I ever saw. The only other player I would compare to him closely would be Ken Griffey Jr., who I would also put in strictly on skill alone. Strictly on what I saw, what I perceived about him, how I felt about his play even if he had tested positive for steroids. A player, another player that we disagree on that my brother would put in that I would not put in is Mike Piazza. Now, Mike Piazza is statistically the greatest hitting catcher of all time. That's undeniable. You can't argue with those statistics. But in my opinion, when you take away the fact that Mike Piazza was a catcher, and he was a catcher because early in his career they wanted to get his bat in the lineup, he was not someone who was brought up to be a catcher. He was not a good catcher in his career. He was a bad catcher. In key situations, they would put his bat in the lineup, but they would not put him at the catcher position. They would designate, hit him. They would do whatever they could. They would put someone else who could actually play the position in to play catcher. So the fact that he's, the fact that he was a catcher is spurious to me. And when you just take his offensive numbers and compare him to someone like a Manny Ramirez or a Barry Bonds, he doesn't stack up. But more importantly, when I think of Mike Piazza as a player, even as an offensive player, I don't, I don't think, I don't feel as though he was special. I don't feel as though he was really heads and shoulders above anyone in any aspect of the game. And when I think about this question of whether or not plants feel pain, and if so, whether or not vegans should consider plant suffering the same as animal suffering, I think, you know, thinking rationally about it, I think you can throw it out from the beginning. I don't think it's worthy of talking about. Because anyone who makes this argument, I don't think... 99.9% .9 of the people who actually make this argument, who actually engage this rhetoric, actually truly believe it. I don't think anyone believes that animal suffering is equivalent to plant suffering. In fact, I think the people who make this argument, if they truly met someone who believed that plants feel pain 
and that plant suffering was equivalent to animal suffering. I think that they'd look twice at that person. I think they think that person was a little weird, a little scary, and maybe even potentially dangerous. So it's a completely disingenuous argument. It's a troll argument. It's not really worth our time for that reason alone, in my opinion. But I think in a real way that the attempts that I've seen to be desperately deductive, desperately rational, desperately studious and erudite on this question have led to some very narrow answers. It doesn't even make sense from an evolutionary perspective for plants to feel pain since they can't fucking move. I mean, first of all, are there no plants that move? Is that really a truly accurate statement for Richard to make? Think about that argument. Vegan Gaines is saying that if you can't move, there's no evolutionary advantage whatsoever for you to feel pain. For you feeling pain. The pain sensation. What if you're on the other end of the spectrum? What if you can move, but you can't feel pain? How would someone or something feel about that? What does that mean for them? Someone who suffers from SIPA. Congenital insensitivity to pain. Someone who can move, but literally cannot feel pain. Someone who in a very real way could put their hand down on a lit burner of a stove. And if someone doesn't point it out to them or they don't notice, their hand could be disfigured irreparably going forward in a way that really affects their ability to conduct everyday life. The complexities of that condition really, really change how someone sees and how someone approaches every aspect of existence. I mean, if you have SIPA, like it's not just that you can't feel hurt. You literally, you can't thermoregulate. You literally, you can't sweat. There's a whole slew of complications that come with not being able to feel pain that make it really, really a big challenge. Plants do not have pain receptors and they do not have a nervous system. They do not have nerve cells. You know, the more I hear about how plants don't have nerve pathways, they don't have this or that, the more I feel that argument overall just blows because they don't have the hardware and the capacity to feel as much that it's chill to kill them and eat them. I don't know, that premises starts to sound kind of evil. So, make the vegan is right. Plants definitely don't have nerve cells akin to animals. They don't have those systems set up. It's not within them. But there's something in biology called an analogously evolved structure. An analogous structure. Basically what that means is when you compare two physical adaptations, the classic example being the wing of the bird and the wing of the bat. A mammal and a bird. <laughs> Both have wings. Both have the same physical adaptation. They're able to fly. That really figures into how they live their lives. But when you slice open the wing of a bat, slice open the wing of the bird, they look very different. The way the bones are put together, the bones involved are very different. The tissues are arranged very differently. It is not the same thing. The evolutionary events that led to the bat evolving wings for flight and a bird evolving wings for flight are very different. While they are basically the same adaptation, they are analogous. They are analogs of each other. The story behind them is very different. The way they're actually built is very different. As far as the time scale of evolution, plants appeared before us. They've been on this planet a lot longer than us. They've seen more climates than we have. They've seen more massive extinction events. They've survived it all. So while a plant may not have the exact identical system as a human or an animal, is it possible that they have a more simpler, a more rudimentary version of that, that they've developed in their own way, with the own raw materials that they have to use. Anesthetist Monica Bermelin is about to perform an unusual experiment. Her patient today is a houseplant. The slightest touch makes its leaves spring shut. She's giving it a drink of ether, an early knockout drug used in humans. After an hour, it's time to test the result. 
there's not a flicker of movement. Ether works to stop nerve cells from transmitting signals. But a plant has no nerves. So why does the ether work? Professor Edgar Wagner is conducting an experiment on electricity. Electrodes connect the plant to a computer, able to record the faintest of electrical signals. The professor burns a leaf, and the computer comes alive. The injured plant is producing a definite electrical signal. A 50 millivolt charge races across its body and down its stem, passing through the same tiny tubes as its sap. It surges forward like a human nerve signal, though the signal moves more slowly than it does in humans. The plant shows a definite electrical reaction to the flame. Tests suggest that electrical signals are what trigger the plant to flinch. When the mimosa was treated with ether, it stopped transmitting these signals and went to sleep. You know, sometimes I wonder when we make these videos that have all these examples that try to fit all this information into one 10 minute frame, if we cover certain things that are really meaningful in just such a soft way that something is lost. But throw that analysis aside. What's really important to me in a lot of ways is how I feel about the things I see. Whether it's a Hall of Fame ballot or whether it's thinking of a serious ethical question like this. What's most important to me is how I feel when I watch that video. And honestly, there's something about that video that when I watch it and you see that scientist burning the leaf of the plant and then you see the electrical signals passing through it and you see how it turns up on the computer, you see the hills and the valleys on the screen. There's something that's creepy about that, something that's horrific about that. Something that seems Frankensteinish and medievalish. And I'll be honest, there's a part of me that the hairs on the back of my neck stand up a little bit. Basically in the same way as they would if I was watching an animal being tortured in a horrible way. There's something monstrous about that that registers in the same way it would for an animal that was feeling pain. And I can't ignore that. And honestly, if you're vegan and that notion does trouble you, that plants feel pain, that plants can suffer in a similar way or some capacity of the way that animals do, I can sympathize with that. But in a big way, in all honesty, veganism is not going to solve that. Veganism really doesn't care. Veganism is not concerned with the suffering of plants. In all honesty, I don't think pain, whether something feels pain, is that important when it comes to veganism, the central tenets. I mean, think about it. If the meat industry said, all right, vegans, here's what we'll do. We're still going to kill animals, but we're going to pull out all the stops, whatever it costs, we're going to make it completely painless, no fear involved whatsoever. The animals will feel like they're on a summer vacation up until the moment that they die. Nothing. No negative emotions. Would that really matter to us? Would it make any difference if the death was a painful one or if it was a non-painful one? It's still death. These animals are still being born to die still living with nothing but a metal roof and a cement floor beneath them. Would it make any difference? I don't think it does. And consider what would happen if stamping out pain was a critical edict of veganism. Where would that take us? Say we come up with a diet that somehow allows us to make it so that animals and plants don't suffer at the hands of vegans in any way. What next? Is that the end of it? What about bacteria? If plants feel pain or some type of pain, something like pain, is it any less reasonable to assume that maybe bacteria, some kind of bacteria feel, can feel pain too, that they have the constructs to do that as well? And if they do, what, is, what does that mean now? Am I not allowed to disinfect anything? Is that going to become part of veganism? What about viruses? Are vegans then supposed to be against the curing of AIDS? The destruction of retroviruses? 
because we we don't want to cause anything any pain because that's really important to us apparently no it, i think it becomes silly after a while it goes to a place where veganism is not really ready or capable of taking it but again i'll say it again i am sympathetic if the idea of plants feeling pain concerns you and you know maybe veganism can't give you answers to that maybe veganism itself can't help you deal with that but there are other issues out there that can Suppose that being concerned for this issue leads you to be highly involved in logging activism or def activism concerning deforestation. Or what about even food loss, food waste? I mean, think about fruits and vegetables. That makes up a really large portion of our food waste in North America and really around the world. Whether it's at the level of packing and transport, quality control, or even food losses on the sale room floor in the supermarket. I mean, just because of environmental conditions, because things rot when they sit out there and no one buys them. I mean, those are, those are worthwhile issues. And if your concern for the suffering of plants leads you to be more involved in those, that's a beautiful thing. I think that's great. But veganism itself is not going to be enough. It's not gonna get you there. It's simply not involved. I'm willing to also sit here and tell you that I really don't care about plants. I really don't. It has nothing to do with my reasons to go vegan. It's a very simple question for me. I mean, this whole thing is honestly a very, a much more simpler thing than I've made it out to be. It literally comes down to if I have a carrot in one hand and I have a piglet in the other hand, which one am I honestly going to feel bad about cutting in half? I don't care about the plant. I don't care about the carrot. I know that I'm going to feel really bad about cutting the piglet in half. That's really more reflective of my basis for veganism, my basis for what I believe, my basis for making a change. And for me, that's really powerful, the fact that I feel that way now. Because not even a year ago, I would say, well, it's a year now because I've been vegan for a year, but let's say two years ago, you know, that's not, that wouldn't have been representative of who I was. Or what I thought. There was a time when I would have been happy to kill animals. I would have been more than willing. I would have, I enjoyed it in some level. It was something that a lot of the keepers and even the managers didn't want to do. I've talked about this in other videos, but I'll say it again. They didn't really want to do it because it was a very gruesome and sad and morbid part of the practice. So that was something that they relegated to interns. And there were a lot of interns who didn't want to do it. I was one of the ones who was more than willing to do that. And on some level, I thought it made me a better intern. I thought that somehow when I went to ask for a reference later when I looked for jobs, it would, I would look really good because of that displayed behavior. That my willingness, my readiness to kill animals was an asset in that field. You know, I remember getting complimented by people because of my, how comfortable I was with the act of killing things. How easily it came to me in a sense. And you know, now I look back on it and I feel, I, I feel sad when I think about it because I'm not working in that field anymore. All the animals that I killed, all the bunnies that I bonked or that's what they called it bunny bonking that I bash in the face until they bled out all the chickens I cut the heads off of it didn't get me to where I was hoping it would take me it didn't get me anywhere I eventually decided not to follow that career path any longer what was the point you know honestly for me what I care about in veganism this whole and what I care about as far as animal suffering has nothing to do with any rhetorical arguments, any statistics, whether it's about what is a healthy diet, what is a healthy lifestyle choice, what's good for the planet, what's good for water usage, our carbon footprint, global warming, any of those things really what I care about 
most is really what I feel relates back to the reality that animals in my country and around the world are born for no other purpose than to die. And reality that I've contributed to that and that it does matter. And I feel like for once, in a more, maybe a more real way than ever before, in a, even if it's a small way, I'm contributing to something that is a little bit positive for animals in some kind of measurable way. And I'm not going to apologize for what I care about. I'm just trying to do what I feel makes sense to me.